Hey, everybody. All right, we're still having that darned focus issue. And it's making me mad. Hello. Hope everybody's getting online there. Welcome to Wine Shark Wednesday. Another Wine Shark Wednesday with Glenn here. Visiting you on June 3rd. So, I just want to say hello to everybody out there at Wineland. Different kind of changes and stuff we visited with you guys last week. Uh, for those of you that are brand new or you know, just checking in with us, you know we've got a kind of interesting lineup for you today. We're going to talk about uh, wine fads, about the Shiraz fads or Shiraz fad uh, back in 19, the 1990s. And we're going to do our grocery store grab for uh, Chateau Saint-Jean Merlot. And uh, it's going to be a good show. So i still got to worry about why my camera is giving me this weird little you know, autofocus fuzz here that I can't seem to control on YouTube. So... Go figure, pain in my tail. But we'll figure it out sooner or later. And just hope that you guys don't get seasick uh, attempting to uh, stay focused on me. So uh, anyway, let's talk about uh, what's new. Let's see here. Uh, well, obviously, we've got a, for those of you that have seen the cast before, a uh, slightly different uh, studio setup here, an incremental change, if you will. We've got... Uh, We've got to come through and uh, change my change my orientation here. I've moved my desk around, or I've got a new desk actually that shoots back into the room straight. And then uh, hopefully by the uh, by the weekend we'll have a little backdrop in here. So hopefully none of this focusy business will actually happen anymore. So you know, as we do step by step, ever 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 improving, ever forward. So uh, I've been thinking a lot. I took a little time off earlier in this week. I did a lot of work last week, so I could take a little bit of time off this week, and that's been very uh, refreshing. Spent a couple days visiting uh, online virtually with some with some good friends of mine, which has been nice. So uh, yeah, we were reminiscing about the this year, this time last year, we were uh, stepping off a plane in France and exploring the Normandy coast for the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings, and it was. Pretty epic adventure. It was a lot of a lot of fun, and we really enjoyed it. And just how much uh, you know, things are different between then and now, and you know, I'm both taking an opportunity to step away from phones and computers for a little while back then, and realizing that even today, although we were communicating online, we were really kind of in the mood to uh, well step back and not necessarily deal with uh, the the world for a couple of days. So it was kind of cool. So I hope you guys are uh, staying safe and healthy out there. You know, things are going well for you all. And and uh, you guys are joining us here with a glass of wine. Hey, we got a Shannon Hops on a live feed. Well, hello, Ms. Shannon Hops. Yeah, we are welcome to us on Wine Shark Wednesday. We're getting ready to kind of start our main content portion here. So um, we're going to talk about wine trends today for the first part of the show. So... We started this uh, with a wine for Wine Shark Wednesday a couple of weeks ago. We talked about Merlots, but um, we're going to talk today about Shiraz and the Australian fad of Shiraz that came around in the early 1990s and uh, or mid 1990s to 2000s. And so, uh, first things first, though, let's talk about what the pros and cons of trends. Um, trends are a, a real part of wine and the wine world, and it's something that has has a, a you know I, I have very strong opinions about certain things generally speaking i'm kind of anti-trendy uh because they tend to go the wrong way but the reality is I, i've sat down and thought about it there's a, there's a lot that could be said for both sides of this thing so on the pro side on the good side of things um the pro about trends is it offers discovery it offers people an opportunity to the trends tends to follow new things right they're introducing whatever is new and fashionable. Now, in the world of wine, that's oftentimes nothing that we haven't heard before. They're often uh, what I would call a, a, re, a redo, you know, a, very, a, a 2.0 of an old varietal, for instance. Uh, you know, there's nothing new about Merlot and Shiraz and Malbec and Carmenere or any of these things, right? Those are, they're, they're, they're already in existence, but what they're doing is they're throwing a new spotlight on a new style or a new way of doing things. So for instance, uh, the Shiraz of Australia is very different than the Syrah of the Northern Rhone Valley. And it was something that was a very, was, there was a reason for that trend to go that way. So uh, it often also helps showcase new wine regions on the rise, right? Uh, there's always somebody out there who's producing new wine in the, in the wine world. And for their opportunity on the world stage, 
especially here in our U.S. market, to, to have the opportunity to share their wines with us is not something that happens every day. And these wine trends tend to follow that. So this is kind of a four or five part series. Probably we're uh, this is part two. We're talking about Merlot. We're going to talk about Shiraz. Uh, later, we're going to talk about Malbec. We'll talk about uh, the blending trend. And then we'll later we'll kind of wrap up with what's going on currently with the uh, oh, my God, everything has to be put in the barrel. So anyway, uh, the cons, though, uh, and I want you guys to be aware of when it comes to fads are they're often marketing driven and not merit driven. Right. They it is tend to be the, the tail wagging the dog rather than the other way around. It is not because a bunch of people run to this wine and then the wine industry catches up. and go, Oh, my God, people love this. No, it's usually them trying to feed you the other way around, right? Marketers are pushing to put to create a demand for a product in a very competitive marketplace. And that's that's natural. But just be aware that, that it is marketing driven and have your healthy degree of skepticism and thinking that just whatever happens to be quote unquote popular is probably not necessarily popular. It's what they want you to be. So uh, there's a great quote from uh, Paul Gregot at the uh, Wine Enthusiast that says, you know, wine is a fashion driven product. But it takes years for the industry to respond to increasing demand. If you think about that, that's very true. You know, you can't just decide that people are drinking more Shiraz to simply turn on the Shiraz fountain. Oh, that's a great idea. I should have a Shiraz fountain. But uh, anyway, the Shiraz fountain doesn't exist. You have to grow more grapes if you're going to increase your production. And that takes, you know, usually a minimum of about three years before you get viable production and really good production between, you know, five, say five, 15, 20 years or so. Anyway, that's uh, so that, that's an interesting thing to be aware of is you can't just simply go for it and, and switch on something new, except for the last, the last few. So, yes, a Shiraz waterfall. I mean, see, most people want a chocolate fountain. No, nah, I want a Shiraz waterfall. That's that's what I'm talking about right here. Also saying hello to uh, to Mary and Dave from up in Minnesota. How are you guys doing up there? Glad to see you guys joining us again. And, and uh, as always, hello, Rob. How are we doing? We're good. A Shiraz waterfall is a great idea. So um, anyway, let's talk about how the Shiraz fad came around. Um, in uh, the turn of the century, right, of uh, this century, by the way, the 20th to 21st, you know, it was an influential part of my wine career. So when I was just starting to get into uh, wine professionally, Shiraz was kind of the, the new hotness at that time. And so uh, the, it's something I quickly dove into and really was was very excited because we were getting a lot of high quality fun wines at reasonable prices that I, that were very much uh, tuned into the style that I have become very, very fond of, which I call round reds, uh, you know, red wines that are, have, you know, a little bit of malolactic, they got that plush mouthfeel, real soft tannins, really, you know, got a lot of, got a lot going on in the fruit department is really kind of, you know, is what I really enjoy. So this was a, a great time to get a part of that. So the wine, Australian wine industry really, you know, up until the 1960s was largely fo uh, focused on fortified wines. They didn't make a lot of table wine. Only the, it was something like the, an the per annum uh, drinking for an Australian consumer was something like two liters a year, right? Very, very small table wine production. But in the course of the 70s and 80s, table wine started to emerge and domestic and export uh, opportunities and markets started to spring to life. Um, a historically weak Australian dollar in the 80s and 90s or late 90s, uh, early 90s rather, was an excellent uh, lubrication for this. It basically allowed those exports to be really, really inexpensive in their in their markets and move at a competitive price where you had high quality, again, high quality wine at a very competitive price, which is kind of one of the things that most of these trends, especially when they're from foreign markets, tend to follow. Uh, the Argentinian Malbec trend, the Carmenere trend from uh, Chile, uh, that kind of thing all drive from, you know, that 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 balance in economic trade. So which is a great little feature. It's something that we get to benefit from. So while Chardonnay and Cabernet were in the mix of the Australian wine boom there, they ran into the same problem that American producers were looking at in the 1980s. And that is there was a glut of these two most famous wine styles. I mean, you know, dominating France in the Cab and, and Chardonnay market is a really tough gig. So they were seeking alternate markets and basically, OK, what grape can we really go after that will allow us to have a niche in the market uh, separate from, you know, would basically go where they ain't. So uh, that really kind of offered Shiraz as a great opportunity that just like Merlot had been in the 80s, that in the 1990s, that the Shiraz market and the specific style of New World Shiraz that was coming around in the southern regions of uh, Australia 
it was a great opportunity for them. So, by the way, you know, pro appropriate pronunciation, Shiraz, as opposed to Shiraz or Thira, right? Same grape, different name, right? I get that question all the time. They are the exact same thing. It's just a local nickname for it. Uh, for instance, the French don't call Malbec. Malbec generally is, uh, is in the south of France. It's called Cot. Same grape, different name. There's a lot of that goes around in the wine world, so don't be confused. But it's Shiraz if you're going to pronounce it like an Aussie. So be expecting to hear that from time to time. My California accent will slip in there, and sometimes it's Shiraz, but, you know, like for sure. So anyway, uh, hello to Ms. Donna. I see you over there, and we are waving the chat as I flip back and forth between there and my notes. So uh, anyway... In the 1990s, we start to see this real push uh, out, out through Australia. You've got the, the low dollar, you've got Shiraz coming onto the scene, and uh, a famous uh, wine critic you may have heard of named Robert Parker uh, really starts to laud the works of Dan Phillips and his Grateful Palate Import Company. Um, he also kind of makes a rock star of a man named Chris Ringland, uh, who we actually talked about in the Shiraz, Shiraz wine tasting, uh, which is our very first uh, online wine show. Uh, so we've talked about Chris Ringland and his kind of talent at making really fun, jammy, real powerhouse Shirazes. And Parker and his ratings very much drove American commercial viability for these wines, right? It basically, you know, he it got his his Domineus Requie blessing and therefore stuff goes, starts going blowing up and, and you're getting high quality Shiraz at the price point anywhere from 20 to 120 or more dollars, right? You're getting really good stuff. And, and old school folks like Penfolds and and there are just, you know, jamming the market with all these really, really great wines. Yolumba and I mean, there's there's just a good solid dozen producers that really made their way in the early 90s. And in, uh, in fact, the thing got going so hot that in 1996, the Australian Wine and Brandy Corporation, plus the Winemakers Federation of Australia, launched what they called Strategy 2025. Okay, this is that vision that by 2025 that they were going to have an export uh, a, or a total wine sales of 4.5 billion Australian dollars um, and wanted to become one of the most influential and profitable supplier of branded wines in the world. This was a, a very industry driven, uh, very purposeful we're going to make this our business kind of move. Um, and so if you think about that, that's a, that's a very bold thing. It's also a very uh, unified thing. I mean, I don't know uh, many other country that has that kind of leading to the charge level of cooperation when it comes to making an industry that successful in the alcohol, you know, in the spirits, beer and wine world. So it's kind of remarkable. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, around the 2000s, late 2000s, the, what they what they actually call the mid aughts in down in, down in Australia, things start to go sour. Uh, we start to see droughts. Uh, we start to see export markets between 2007 to 2011 start to crash, uh, and the Aussie dollar starts to become stronger, causing export prices to rise. So. The droughts were causing vineyard issues. Some of the vineyards that they had been growing in these warm climate wines were basically held together by irrigation and some of some not necessarily good uh, agricultural, viticultural practices. And so some of the wineries start to suffer. The, you know, se the, several of the key importer businesses failed. The Grateful Palate folded its doors in like 2010. They stopped shipping in 2008, went into receivership and all kinds, lost all kinds of access to these great brands. So, Things started to go south in just, you know, just 10 years ago and the access to good to that same, you know, quality wine and that $20 sweet spot really kind of dried up. But the good news is the Australian government has invested over $50 million over the course of four years from uh, 2017 through now through 2020 uh, to grow Australia's wine export uh, industry again and to showcase their wine tourism uh, as a destination level event for worldwide wine consumers. So once again, the government is stepping in and helping them kind of, you know, get back on their feet. But the, the, the winemakers themselves are doing the, the, the real, real layman's work here in the fact that they're using a lot more sustainable farming methods. They've got climate, you know, they're using climate appropriate viticulture, and a lot more focus on revitalizing Australian styles, broadening out their portfolio of grape styles from the, you know, kind of the big four or five, the, the Grenache Syrah Movedra blends, the Chardonnays, Cabs, and, and, and you know, and, uh, and anything else. But uh, just last week, for instance, we had a tasting for worldwide styles and, you know, the, the, we've got 
uh, beautiful Rieslings coming from South Australia. You know, you've got all kinds of new things that they're exploring into that are really, really cool. So not only is Australia back on the market, but that also means that Australian Shiraz, although probably not once as strong as it could be, you know, or it had been, is definitely back. And I'm starting to see some of these great 20, for instance, Chris Ringland's $20, uh, you know, R Shiraz is just a great value for the dollar. I mean, it's really just a powerhouse in the, in the class. So very, very cool stuff. So on my, my beat the hype advice, you know, on my, my opinion on, on what you guys should be thinking, you know, what you guys want to be, you know, want to know what I think. Well, I am all about that sweet spot coming back. I am very glad to see that Australia has adapted, that their wine industry is once again, kind of flourishing and cause it can only benefit us, right? It's more things in the wheelhouse when I go to the grocery store or go to the, the wine store that I can see the opportunities to for variety and to have their unique take and style on things. You know, I want a vibrant worldwide wine access. And that's uh, something that's very, very, you know, very, very critical, I think, to our appreciation of how vast and interesting wine can be. So like I said, don't believe the hype, stay away from stuff with animals on the label and you'll be fine. Right. I mean, you can keep your kangaroos and your penguins and your, Anything else? I mean, Greg Norman's shark isn't so bad. Just saying. You know, that's kind of cool. But uh, anyway, that, that you know, stick with some of those major producers and you're going to find some amazing wines from, from people that have been doing it for a good long time. They just hadn't been making it in, uh, in the same ways as uh, some of the New World cousins. And now they are. So rock on. So any questions on, uh, on Shiraz, 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 Shiraz? Before we move on, I don't hear it. I'm just saying that because it's a shark. I'm exactly saying that because it's a shark. I am. I, it's not that I have any particular affinity for golf nor Greg Norman, but the fact that it has a shark on its bottle makes it okay. It's true. I mean, let's just admit. Also, that, that apparently when you're a when you're an Australian golfer, it is or, or, a, or a New Zealand golfer, there is a whole thing for starting your own wine brands. I also found that one of my favorite Sauvignon Blancs was at, it's the the name is spelled n-o-b-i-l-o and i always pronounced it uh, uh nobilo and i realized that i was i was corrected at a, at a at a show where a golfing customer was like no no no, it's nobilo as in this guy and then he was apparently a golfer who also you know, started his own wine brand so apparently if you're from down under that's the way to go i i can say that i don't think my path to success is going to be via a nine iron unless it's a nine iron to the head of somebody who is holding my wine from me. So anyway, all right. Well, cool. Um, excellent. Good to see everybody here. I say we're seeing the stream kind of going well and loving you guys' uh, guys visit. I want to talk now. We're going to do the grocery store grab, all right? It's kind of time to talk about uh, what we do with the grocery store grab. So our premise, for those of you that are just joining us, is to help get you get the best value per dollar for wines that are found at non-specialty and non-big box retailers. Not everybody has access to a great wine store. Not everybody has access to a big commercial wine store like a Specs or a Goody Goody or a Total Wine. Right? Sometimes that's just for convenience or out of necessity, shop at our grocery stores for our wine experience. And so there's there are things to be avoided and things to be to know and to be armed with that best knowledge so you can make good choices. I want to basically help you understand and look through some of the, the hype that you see out there. So the wines that I do that I choose at the grocery store are chosen with no prior research. They're based on the label only and based on label focus. What that means is I'm not just looking for fancy names and pretty labels, but I'm also looking at what information is available to me as a consumer on the bottle that helps me understand what's in the bottle before I take it home, right? Okay, Angela Carter's taking notes. Speak slowly. All right, so no research prior. That's the key, okay? When we talk about wine labels, I'm going to refer you, Miss Angela, actually back to the wine labels basics video. I'll see you've got coming and putting a link up, up here uh, once things are done. But understand that I did a great video on understanding wine labels, what you guys can look for, and uh, how to see through the hype. Um, the short form of that is you can do whatever you want up here on the front of the label. I don't care. This is your advertising space, and it should set you apart. It's it's your it's your maiden plumage. It's your it's your dress for the bar. It's, you know, it's your looking sharp at the wedding. That's what you want to be. Whatever your, you know, mode of opera, uh, modus operandi is when it comes to your wine branding, I'm all for it. You know, you've got artistic stuff and funny stuff. You've got 
elegant stuff and traditional stuff. But the back of the label really should be about information. And so in the wine shark, uh, in the grocery store grab, that's a very big thing for us. So we're going to talk about uh, this week's selection, which is, I'm going to go back up to the camera here. This is the Sato Saint Jean Merlot 2017. Yay, look at that. All right, let's see if we can stop the camera from focus twitching again and making me feel like I'm getting sick. So, all right. And uh, Miss Angela, you watch it again and again and again. You can always rewatch the video. That's true, as Bob points out. So, uh, and that's what you can do is you can slow me down in the in the YouTube settings to be talking very slow. Would be great. So the label, the, the things that we're looking at. So let's we'll, we'll get there in a minute. But the Chateau Saint Jean. Uh, this is a you know kind of traditional. I had heard of these these this winery tertiarily. Uh, they're one of the Sonoma wineries. In fact, actually they've actually got Mission San Sonoma on the uh, on the label. I just happen to know that because I'm from the area originally, but. Um, but it's, but this is a fairly common grocery store wine. I see this stuff everywhere and I've never actually tried it. So I was like, Hey, let's take a look at what they've got offer here. So this was, uh, this, this was acquired for $8 for $7 and 99 cents after uh, club pricing, but was priced with the, at the, at the uh, club price, the pre-club price, right? If you didn't have a card for your grocery store at 15 99. Now I've talked about this before and I'm going to say it again. That's something that I kind of kind of sets me on alert just to begin with, right? When we've got a wine that is very high in price, I mean, so they're saying that this wine is worth sixteen dollars, but they're going to sell it to you for fifty percent of that. That's a pretty bold statement there, Cotton. Let's see how it works out for them. I mean, you got to be wondering about why that wine is half off, and that's not half off like on on a sale, on you know, a on a, 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 a let's got to get this stuff off of our shelves. No, no, that's a, this is our everyday club price brought to you by, you know, insert your grocery store name here. So be cautious of that. I think what that's designed to do is it's designed to make sure that you join their club as much as anything else, because that marketing information is valuable, right? So, but that also do, doesn't necessarily give you a true expression of what the price or value of the wine might be. Okay. Um, we're going to go into a wine uh, pricing video, probably in the next few weeks, where we're going to talk about the question, probably one of the most burning questions I get from all people, and that is, you know, what's in the bottle? Is $100 wine really worth it? That kind of type of questions. So, yeah, exactly, John. The, the, the non-club price is inflated. This uh, that when we, we explored this uh, last time, we very much experienced that. This So my gut tells me this is probably an $8 bottle of wine drinking like an $8 bottle of wine, not a $16 bottle of wine that they gave me half off. But let's find out. Uh, so on the label, as we said, we showed up our Sato Saint Jean bottle label, but on the back, good information. These guys did it right. Like I said, I, I, I went through and made sure that I'm choosing wine in this case where I'm rewarding them for the type of label information that they're giving me. So number one, I want to know what's in the bottle right there on the front. Sato Saint Jean, that's what makes it. But right here, Merlot. Merlot is in the bottle. OK, uh, it doesn't give me any varietal uh, specifications in the U.S. except for Oregon. It's about 75 percent minimum of the single varietal grape. So this is at least 75% Merlot. Uh, again, they did not put any information other than that. Now, you may go to the winemaker's notes and find that there's a different uh, different blend in there. That's normal. But remember, we're not using that information at our choice selection for this task. Okay. When I do uh, professional shows, when I'm doing research for, for wine styles or pairings, that's something I often do. But this is, this is the case where we're not doing it. Uh, where are the grapes grown? Uh, this actually doesn't say here on the front, but it does on the back. This is basically, this is this is bottled in Sonoma, but doesn't give me any specific information about where, it, whether it is a Sonoma AVA or not. It just tells me where the Chateau is. Likely means that it is not using solely AVA rated grapes. That's something new. This means it's, this is, uh, we don't have a word really, or, or a, a classification for it in America. Uh, but in France, for instance, this would kind of be called a VDP, a Val de Pie, wine of the country. Um, here, we don't really call it table wine anymore, but that's basically what it means. So these grapes are probably not from Sonoma proper, or at least not all of them. Although that's where Sato Saint Jean is located. I wonder if it's Jean or Jean. Well, we'll have to decide. Let's be very French. You call it Saint Jean. So uh, it says here on the back, right, that they're. That, by the way, they had a family dream. They're going to give me a couple sentences of marketing. They, I grant them that. That's their job. Right. So built on the family's dream to create a world class winery in the heart of California, Sato Saint Jean, 
was conceived as a fine wine estate with European style. See, European style. That's Jean, not Jean. Jean never been to know Europe, but Jean has. All right, but here's the kicker part of the important new piece of information. That's the nice. I'm glad to know where you're from. I now know why this picture is on the, on the label. So here we go. We're not in Texas. It ain't Gene. We're in Sonoma, Tina. So uh, here we are. So this is the so that's marketing out of the way. Here's the the the, the gut of what I want to know, right? Because this is this is after we know where we're from, what the grapes are grown, and the more specific specificity, the better. We want to know what does the wine taste like. Assume that I don't know what Merlot tastes like. If I'm a new to wine person, I want to see flavor words. I want to see wine and food pairings, preferably in specific terms, right? Those would be the best possible world. So here we have, we invite you to enjoy this plush Merlot showcasing notes of plum, black cherry, and toasted spice on the finish. Flavor words, specifics, good. Didn't provide me with any uh, any uh, food pairings, but okay. You know, I would rate this, this, this one overall is maybe a solid C plus, B minus when it comes to, you know, they, we didn't, we know it told me who they were, where they were, when, what's in the bottle and a little bit of flavor. They could have gone better, but not awful. And of course, it also says, who are, who are they? Well, obviously they're Sato Saint-Jean, but then they also talk about the actual bottling company, which sometimes can give us a clue as to whether the winery that's on the label is necessarily part of a bigger company or bigger wine family. So now comes the time for doing the tasty parts, right? This is the best part. This is why I do my job. Uh, so uh, color-wise, let's talk about that. So the first things first. Uh, color. It's got. It's it's very lightly extracted. The color range is a pale garnet. It's not It's not nearly as uh, as dark end of the fruit as I a fruit range spectrum and the color spectrum as I would expect from a Merlot. Uh, so this uh, again, just indicate just by guessing that and knowing at the price point, eh, it's probably not got a lot of oomph going on in the glass from a uh, juice per you know per per volume level. Okay, the color's a little thin for the style, if you ask me. Although if they're going for a European style, that wouldn't surprise me, but this isn't, you know, this isn't really a European style of wine. It's still California. Okay. Uh, next up, take a, so we take a swirl here and take a sniff. Okay. Um, kind of some generic dark fruit stuff on the front. We got a little bit of blackberry. And that I definitely definitely get their plum. That's a nice, nice bit of ripe plum there, which is one of my favorite summer fruits. Really, really nice. A um, little bit of heat coming off in the nose. You can smell the alcohol here. Uh, this is 13.8% ABV. Uh, that is, uh, that's running towards the hot side and the nose shows it because there's not a lot of fruit or other primary flavors uh, to, to cover that up. So you're definitely getting that. So, all right, let's swirl around here. Let's take a sip. Okay, here, kind of um, a middle and fruit palette. I mean, this is, it's very lightweight. In fact, way lighter in style than I would have expected out of Merlot. This would be that kind of, I would expect this out of an, out of a uh, 80s Merlot uh, that was trying to be very mass market. It is, it is very light. It's, it's got more of the red fruit, not black fruit on the tongue. Say so it's drifting towards pomegranate and, and raspberry rather than plum, or maybe a red plum, not a fully you know, dark black plum. And uh, the tannins, though, are, 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 are a little green, but very well managed. They're not over, it's not overly grippy. Okay, this doesn't really have a lot of oomph in the in it behind the uh, behind the wine there. You're not getting that, you're not getting that flavor uh, carrier, right? We've talked a, a couple of times about how tannin is a frame on which we fl hang flavor. Um, you might also call, call it like a carrier wave where it's the thing that grips your tongue for that flavor to then lock in on. It's a nice example. Uh, there's so good examples of that, or, you know, you really want to feel that grip and then that, then that grip follows with all these fun, uh, secondary and tertiary flavors, the flavors of fermentation, the flavors of aging, the flavors of oak, all those kind of things. Right. So it's carrying all those flavors, flavor compounds in there, but yeah. Definitely middle front of the mouth, fully bone dry, but it's got a nice bit of juiciness that kind of it's so it's not no matter it's not at all sweet, but it's got that fruit that, that, that kind of helps you feel like it. It's got it's got a good bit of acidity, 
for a red wine, we are probably, you know, we're, we're in that, the, that decent level of acidity that makes your mouth water. It gives it that crisp, juicy feeling like uh, fresh fruit, which is nice. That would make this a fun kind of food partner, a very do no harm food partner. Um, it's just the weird part is it's, this is, it drinks what far closer to say a Pinot Noir or a Gamay than it does like a, any sort of traditional or even California style Merlot. Um, so just saying that's a, that's a part where you want to, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a very departure of style. I wouldn't expect this in that way, right? This is a very interesting one. So, uh, we generally ask ourselves three questions when it comes to our grocery store grab. Is it well executed? Is it on style? And is it worth the price tag? So is it well executed? Yeah, no flaws here. Um, it doesn't, I mean, I'm not sure what kind of quarters they may be cutting, but this is, it's kind of, I mean, it's got that mass produced kind of feel to it. It's not, it's, it, but it's definitely do no harm. It's, you know, it's, it's got, it's got some high alcohol, a little bit warm, a little bit warm on the nose, but not so much in, on the, on the middle of the late palate. It's got that, it's it's eminently drinkable, right? Um, when I'd say it's on style, I would say no, but in a good way. You know, it doesn't have what I would expect out of a full punch Merlot. But then on the other hand, it's not. Yeah, so that's the thing. If you were aiming for a Merlot and you got this, you'd be like, hey, this is this is, doesn't doesn't carry the weight I'm looking for. I need more, uh, right? So you need more. We need more. We need more honks. So that being said, is it worth the money? 100%, man. Eight bucks for a bottle of wine like this. This is a wine you take to, the, to, to somebody else's party. You know, poolside, burgers, dogs. I mean, it's not good. This one's not going to get you a second date or anything, but this is pretty good. You know, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't kick it out of bed for eating crackers. So we said that Shannon says that it looked good. So watching Wine Shark is while on duty is, oh, man, I apologize, ma'am. I'm, I'm so sorry that you have to be working and watching me drink wine. That makes me feel like a bit of a bastard. And I apologize. So uh, Donna was saying, you know, maybe a coffee tumbler. No, you may not encourage the, the, the hops to be at work drinking. That's that's not allowed. That's just for safety purposes. Safety third, right? So if it got lost in the back of your cellar, do you think it would be better if you fear some now? Uh, no, this wine is not built to age. Absolutely. Great question, Tina. Uh, but remember, when we talk about wines that have ageability, some of the things they have to have is a tannic structure. They've got to have that high level of polyphenolic compounds. They've got to have those uh, that that level of grape in there that's going to benefit from the aging process, which is a process of breaking apart and rejoining in these fun combos that are as mystery to man. Uh, but that's this isn't going to get better with time. This is 100% a drink now. It's 2017 already. Okay, so that means it, it was released in 2018. Uh, fall, you know, by by around the fall. So that's already two years going, you know, going on, you know, one and a half, almost two years old. It's in its peak right now. This is as good as it's ever getting. This is just, you know, this is a pop star's third album. It's a throwaway, make some money. It's kind of cool. Um, I bet you if I dug into Sato Saint Jean, um, I want to see what they have, they, how much they go up the scale, right? Is this just their baseline? Is this, uh, is this entire label a value priced wine that's designed to punch in the $10 market? If so, they're doing an incredible job. They're not they're not screwing anything up. But as I said, they're also not winning any awards here, right? This is not a wine that you're hanging a Robert Parker score on by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, if you guys watched my uh, video on wine ratings tomorrow, you'll get a little bit more insight onto my, uh, my opinions on that. So that'll be coming out uh, tomorrow afternoon once I finish editing it down and uh, it will send it your way. So learn about the, 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 the rating systems, the pros and cons, and all kinds of stuff. Hang on. There's a siren going on, which I think means Shannon is pulling up in her truck. That's hilarious. So anyway, um, so what questions do you have? We're at about the a little over the halfway mark here. I mean, basically, we're open to, to questions and Q&A. You know, I bring you guys here to enjoy a glass together and kind of talk about what's been going on. But uh it's a, uh, you know, it's been a kind of a slow day, so we've, we've moved along pretty quickly, I guess. This is good. And Shan says she will catch up later. Very nice. Well, I have, I have absolute doubt that when, upon the appropriate times, you shall be rewarded with a fine glass of vino, the way that everybody's day should end in a civilized manner, as to with a nice glass of wine. 
So we're going to do some fun stuff upcoming too. I mean, I want to know what you guys have been drinking. Um, I've been uh, exploring some some things in the wine shark world to try and uh, try and figure out what the uh, we got June pretty well mapped out from here. Uh, big bold reds. Well, big bold reds are on. You've got several of those coming up, Miss Hops. Uh, to to give you examples, this weekend on Saturday we're going to be talking uh, about port pairings. We're going to take two different ports, a tawny and a ruby, and do some fun food pairings. I've got uh, a recipe for fig and Stilton squares out there. We've got some uh, maple caramelized walnuts, some salted caramels, and some, uh, what else? Oh, yeah, I get some dried currants and cranberries, that kind of thing. We're going to talk about ports and do a port primer. It'll be freaking awesome. Bob says right now he's drinking a little France, a little Dave Finney joint. Brought to you by Orin Swift Winery. Very nice. The location series. That stuff is awesome. I uh, made there. There was a. Uh, I, I've got a few of those as well. So for those of you that are curious about Bob's F wine, uh, you will be receiving some feedback from that. Uh, those of you that are patrons have already seen me in the what I'm drinking category. Give that a little review. But I've also got locations from Italy and Spain and the one from France. So I'll be trying those out on the show and sprinkling them around as necessary. They are pretty awesome little blend of jams from uh, the best that basically a country has to offer is Dave Fitty's kind of mode. And he's always a little bit of a vanguard, always out there doing, you know, really esoteric and fun stuff. And the location series are great. I got them at a wildly good deal at a, at a, Bob and I's local grocery that was doing a store reset. And so they had had a steep discount on a lot of wine that they needed to remove to get it out of the way, I'm assuming. Um, plus in these strange times, you know, they're doing what they can to uh, support their business. But I got these wines at a song for $5 a bottle. It was delightful. Gotta say. So other than your trademark port. All right. So I, think you, I don't think you can trademark port, John. That's a whole, I mean, that's a thing, right? I mean, there's got to, there's, there's, they've already got a trademark. That is theirs, their thing. I mean, you're Oporto. So Prosecco, very nice, from Valdovio Dene. Yes, say, Denominazione Origine Controllata Prosecco Superiore Valdovio Dene. Which I sound a whole lot of Italian right there, so that was kind of cool. So you're very, your bottle is very gold glittery. Yeah, dude, that's that's because they're trying to sell that wine. To a to a to a you know amazing female market to say this is sparkly and glitter fun. So Tina says drinking wine with a dog on the label, but it's good. The Greeter Red by Scout and Cellar. Oh uh, yeah, that's excellent. So Tina had talked to me about Scout and Cellar, and we may be uh, getting a feature of them coming up pretty soon, where Tina is going to help us uh, help us with some of her wines from her from her club there. That's pretty awesome. It's a Syrah Cab Zin blend. Wow, that's an interesting one. Yeah, a little high alcohol, I believe it. That's Those are three hot-running big, bold reds, so they kind of go this way with their alcohol. It's very nice. Used to make a glaze for the beef short ribs. Very nice, Bob. You see, there you go. Bob's also demonstrating one of our, our classic uh, foodie tricks, right? I mean, if you really want to make people fall in love with the wine that you're serving with dinner, you put a little bit of it in the food. You put a little bit in the final sauces, the, that final preparation. You cook with the wine you're serving, and there's this amazing harmony in their mouth. And they're like, what did you do? Amazing things. It's cool. It's really fun. So drink a meritage. Yes. Or actually, pr pr appropriately pr pronounced, actually. I found out it is not meritage. I thought it was a very fancy word. But actually, meritage is a California winemaker portmanteau. And it's actually a combination of the word merit and heritage. And is pronounced meritage. So a Meritage from Land and Winery north of Dallas. Got about three years of age. Interesting. I wonder to see what Landon has done for there. That's what, so that's what I said. DOCG. Dominazione Origine Contrata y Garantita. So there you go. I'll get your Garantita in there. I can't forget you, Rose. Where is the info on the food stuff for Saturday? It is linked on the wine calendar. The best place to see it is on the Google calendar because there's direct links. Uh, but they're also in your e-ticket. Whenever you purchase a ticket, you will see that in the description there's links, and I actually link them to the recipes that we're using this week. 
Um, if you don't do the puff pastry, if you don't, if you're not, if you, if you don't want to handle dealing with puff pastry for the fig and Stilton squares, just find yourself some good fun fig preserves and get a good Stilton cheese. You can do them on table water crackers. It doesn't have to be the puff pastry, but the puff pastry does add a delightfully flaky and uh, textural component to that counteracts and kind of plays off of the Stilton cheese. So I highly encourage that. Um, if you guys are looking for even bigger wine, wine stuff for the tasting, um, if you want something some more substantial, remember these ports are going to be on the sweeter, bigger, bolder side. So this is an opportunity for your chicken with teriyaki, stuff with soy in it. Um, you could easily do uh, anything. I mean, Worcestershire-based stuff would be fun to go with a savory component opposite the sweet. Um Big cheese, you know, this is that, uh, you know, you go very well with just a, a fun cheese tray of everything from Wesleydale cheddar all the way through the Stilton family of blues. It'd be great. Um, a snake and herring Sauvignon Blanc. Snake and herring. That sounds like, that's an exciting name. All I have is all I have to say. You know, I mean, I'm sure those are people's names. Maybe Mr. Snake and Mr. Herring. Or are they actually got a snake and a fish on the label? There's so many questions, Dave and Mary. So many questions. Firestone and Robertson. These are also people that make tires. I'm not sure about all that, Jason. So are they sold out this weekend's tasting? The answer is no. Um, they don't see them on the Google calendar. All right, fine. Tina's going to give me a heart attack in the middle of the show. Allow me to open up my Gmail here and find out whether there is indeed still stuff on my Google calendar. Well, and also you should, if you go to Facebook events, I know that the thing is live now. Port Pairings has got tickets there. So you can go to Facebook and you can click the events section and you can see the opportunities there. It should link you directly to it. So yes, plenty of tickets still available. All right. So I'm double checking right now, just to be sure, Tina, just to make sure that everybody can come if they want to. I would hate to be, for you to be without my company on a Friday night. It would be just boring. And yeah, we're good to go. You should be at the Eventbrite page and you're awesome. It's great. So if you have any other questions, go ahead and reach out to me directly. I'll make sure that they're are possible and maybe i'll post a link in the in the description once this go ahead and renders by the way these are rendering really fast these days i mean the uh when i was talking to you guys about commenting on the videos not just in the chat um it, the last video once i immediately turned and rendered it it was up within like seven minutes of the time i was off the air so if you have no patience if you still got a little bit of wine left at the end of the show and you can stick around go throw some comments in there let me, uh, that way we've got persistence within the uh, within the, the, the platform. And some of these questions can get captured for much easier later reference rather than somebody watching the scroll go by. So, all right. So Tina and John, we've got, we've got you're good. Tina, you're amazing. Don't worry about it. You're going to be joining. Oh, you've left Facebook. We're good. But it's good news. Don't get on back for me. Use the Google Calendar. It's in there. And uh, you can find out through that. Or if you're on the Wine Shark mailing list, you should have received a, a June newsletter that has all four June upcoming shows to include Port Pairings, Cabernet Sauvignons, 10 to 20. That's uh, Shannon Hops' wheelhouse right there. She's going to have a great time with that show. Then we're going to go Rosé all day on the 19th. And then on the 26th, we're doing Wine Sharks Food, Wine Shark Plus from the Grill Edition. Dun, dun, dun. It's going to be so awesome. I love it. I'm very excited about all of these shows. I mean, I've got uh, a bunch of us. Yes, there is a mailing list, John Kerry. I will, uh, here, let me, actually, you can go to wineshark.com and in the, I believe in the contact page, there's a sign up form. You can go there. Basically, the, the mailing list, you're going to get information once a month on what the, up, a link to all the upcoming shows, right? Of course, you, so you got one convenient place uh, to look at that and give you a little forecast. Although I, of course, duplicate the information in across Facebook and the Google Calendar. You know, I'd like to be redundant, give you lots of options as where to find me. But uh, then I've also got sometimes featuring videos. Um, I'm going to work towards doing uh, a specific piece of content for that uh, format in the future. But I know people's inboxes are wildly full. I know mine is. So I don't want to use email as a primary way of communicating with you guys. So once a month is all you're basically going to hear from me unless there's a special event or some other emergency uh, but basically you can get the, the monthly newsletter and I'll probably start throwing in an article or, or an article in there just within the newsletter that's basically linked to that. 
just to give just to give you guys some additional value, you know, to, to, to do that. And yes, there is a snake and a herring on the label, says Mary. All right. Well, the nicknames for the makers. Well, that's some uh, Semillon and an Aussie Bordeaux blend. Interesting. Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. That's yeah. That's that sounds like a that's a that's a Bordeaux Blanc style, right? That's 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 not unreasonable. Well, um, one of my favorite uh, uh, Blancs from Bordeaux is, that we tried in our Sauvignon Blanc class or it was, is a great example of that kind of mix that they use in that Entre du Mer region, right? I mean, beautiful seafood friendly, green grassy, delightful stuff. Um, where in Australia is it from there? Is it, I don't know, since Mary and Dave are both posting, I'm not sure if it's Mary or Dave that's drinking it, but one of the two is drinking that. So let me know which area it's from and we can go take a look at that a little bit later because that's always, uh, South Australia, you know, there's some surprisingly cool growing wine regions. Well, the Clairevale Riesling that we tried last Friday uh, was, you know, an amazing example of an entire area, Clare Valley, where they've got Ries they've got a whole Riesling trail there, right? They're very focused on that type of grape, and so it's it's a very different style than you're used to if you're used to Germanic Rieslings. Uh, it's got this kind of funky diesel nose and this delightful crisp uh, citrusy line to a Riesling that I didn't, that I've never found, uh, in, in other examples, right? Mostly you end up in the green apple, uh, kind of range. And this was a great example of one that's got this white flower, orange blossom, mandarin orange kind of twinge to it, which was really, really fun. So awesome, right? I love it, love, love it, love it, love it. But yeah, so lots of ways to find out what we do is the email address, promo reset every month. The answer is uh, for those of you that are Patreon members at the $20 and above level, you get a free wine tasting uh, discount code once a month. I have not sent them out yet, Rob. They come out on the 5th because I wait for everybody's uh, payments to process on Patreon, which just happened yesterday. So I have not yet got to that, but you will receive an email um, with your with your code. And actually, your, your 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 code will always be the same. It'll be your own the, the, your own email that you used for sign up for Patreon, and you'll be good to go from there. So I just have to punch them into the system. I promise I'll help. I'll do it when I get off this call. How about that? It'd be awesome. You will be rewarded for your service. I love to tell you to get, treat you guys special because you guys are so awesome and supportive. Label says West Australia, Margaret River. Ah, oh, fun, fun area. Margaret River Valley out there up close to Perth is this really cool dynamic. If you're into surfing and wine, you should totally go there. It is like the two, those are the two things that they're amazing at. Um, they also make some really amazing Riesling out there. These delightful river rock Rieslings that are just powerhouses in the category. Um, but yeah, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, I totally see that growing up there because it's a, uh, it defines another good example of a, of a uh, cold climate, maritime climate influenced wine region. So Margaret River, yeah, out there in the, out there in the West near Perth. And there's my mediocre Aussie accent, for, you know, I have to spend time talking to my friend Ben, who lives in uh, Sydney, uh, between him and my friend Mark Meekin, right? Just hanging out with him in Vegas one time, right? These two, these two lads are really all about a good drink. And uh, if you're ever going, if you're ever in the mood to really go have fun drinking, find yourself three Australians. Two minimum, three is better. But with that, you have a safe number of Australians to travel with. Any more than that, and it gets becomes kind of kind of sketchy. I mean, you might even become Australian. You never know. All right. Well, any other questions we've got so far? We got a lot of lively conversation going on today. I love it. And we're speaking. Um, other things, uh, we also start seeing from our Patreons, right? You guys are going to get to vote on what July topics we're going to do. I've started uh, thinking, though, that just from a, from a cadence perspective, we're going to start alternating weekends or weeks, rather, for the, for the tastings. So the Wine and Cheese show, for instance, is so popular, uh, and I've got enough, um, I've got enough of, of content for Wine and Cheese to do dozen shows if I want. Uh, but based on thinking about doing a wine and cheese show, one show every month. Okay. So maybe like the second weekend is always wine and cheese or the second week, rather second Friday. Then we'll do two wine styles in a month and you guys can choose the order in which they come. But then we'll also do another wine and food focus show like the grilled show, right? We have, we have this month, we've got both port and the grilled show coming. 
but next month, you know, we want to probably want to, the grill's going to be fun for June, but what do we want to do for July? You know, we want to focus on barbecue, maybe smoked meats, smoked food. That'd be kind of fun. Um, but I'm going to throw some ideas out there, let you guys vote on them, get your feedback. And then we'll go, we'll go ahead and produce, pu start publishing the, the what's coming up next. I can tell you right now, uh, the one that's not on the, the list yet, but has been set in proverbial electrons is uh, bubbles. So for July 3rd, we will be doing sparkling wines because this is like fireworks or something in my head. So Rob says at Christmas time when they pub crawl, it is a must see in life. The Aussies. I, I can see, I can get behind that. I can totally. And especially because Christmas is in summer down there. So that has to be a thing that I need to see in my life. I, I, I definitely need to have some sort of inner tube for safety while I drink wine in the Barossa Valley. I can, I can see it now. Board shorts, full on ugly American with the Aussies in tow. That'd be great. So, so there would be interesting. We have a wine shark pub crawl, not even a wine tour, just to see how long we can last kind of mode. Get out the wine bong. Jason asks, uh, is there ever a wine to pair with breakfast when you have it when, when you have it for dinner, which we call Brenner, if you guys are fans of the of scrubs, um, with eggs and biscuits and gravy. So when it comes to wines for for breakfast, we, let's think about what breakfast foods generally are. Um, it depends. So depending on if we're going like like in your example, eggs, biscuits, gravy, we've got savories on the table, right? Eggs are usually pretty delicate, right? So we kind of kind of got to be, be careful with those. But um, biscuits and gravy, you know, we got sausage and salt and fat, right? This is just you know, awesome. So if you had that same same concept, right, that you had, uh, if you just took fats and savory and creamy as a dinner option, you know, where would you be in your wine world? Well, you've got that that you're starting to get into the realm of bigger, healthier whites and and medium to better, medium to bolder reds, because. You've got enough tan in there. You've got fat and tan that can go against it. Now, with the flavors that come along with sausage and the fact that it's a white cream sauce, that to me would tend to go back towards the white end of the spectrum. This is where your uh, your 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 chardonnays, your you know your full body semillons, your uh, oh what am I thinking about Northern Rhone whites here, right? You know, you get into um, I want to say Vermentino, and that's not the right answer. But I've got to hit my tongue that one grape that I'm trying to remember out of the 400 or so viable grapes in the world. Uh, but anyway, so this is that middle to heavier white, right? I want to I want to see something with a little bit of oomph in it. I want to stay away from citrusy. I'd like to go with things that are greener, grassy, and boom, there we go. Wine for breakfast is Guinness. Just saying, yeah, that's not that's not a thing, Bob. That's that's I mean that's the the Guinness in your coffee. I mean, come on, that's that's too easy. So, and the, uh, but the entire, uh, but the entire breakfast, remember the breakfast world's got a lot going on, right? If you're going to start throwing in, uh, you know, bacon, bacon fat, pepper, sausages, savory stuff like that, I'm going to steer you towards, you know, new world Shiraz, Shiraz. I'm going to say that in the world of, if you're on the lighter though, if you know, if we're, if we're in the yogurt, granola, fresh fruit kind of mix, then we're sticking towards stuff that's light, floral, bubbly. This is your Prosecco, Cava. You know, there's a reason we have mimosas, you know, with with brunch because it's a very light, very palate cleansing experience. It helps clean that food. You've got acid from the uh, from the orange juice, bubbles from the prosecco. Your palate's getting scraped clean like the ice at a Stars game, and boom! Next thing you know, you got you know fresh new food flavor, and you can really appreciate that Belgian omelet and whatever other heart attack on a plate you're having. So there is absolutely a place for for wine at the breakfast table. It's just you know, usually we don't think of it as breakfast. We usually think of it as brunch because, well, day drinking sounds like a little bit obsessive. So, all right. You're thinking elk sausage. Now, see there, that'd be kind of cool. Now, I have no point of reference for good elk sausage. That would be something I would definitely have to experiment with. Um, how gamey is elk sausage? You know, is it like venison where it's got or, or you know, where it's got a kind of a, a spin on that very... Um, you know, and in the sausage fat, right? I mean, we talk about venison, we tend to think lean meats, but if we're talking to sausage, obviously we've got ground fat in there. What was it spiced with, right? Is it just the flavor of the meat by itself or does it carry something else with it? Does it got, has it got, 
any sort of pepper or or savory from spices like you know sage, marjoram, uh, you know anything in that darker green range, you know, and fennel, for instance, which is your iconic Italian sausage flavor. You know, any one of those things would be that. Not just for breakfast anymore. That's right. Guinness for all occasions. So I love that. And mm, day drinking. That's true. That's, we're not day drinking now. I mean, the, the sun's still out, but it is way over the yard arm. So we got about five minutes of show here. Uh, just to check my notes. Um, we did again. We uh, talked about Saturday. Port pairings is available. Hope to see some of you guys there. It's going to be fun with uh, just a couple of different ports and some some really interesting concepts on flavorings, right, that you get to play around with, just a little bites. So those are provided. Like I said, check out the Google Calendar. Um, for your comments, if you guys want to come back, uh, what's your take on Australian Shiraz? Are you still drinking it? Are you still into it? Are you over it? Um, ask any questions that you have about wine fads down in the comments below. Um, if you like what you're doing, you know, hit that like button, subscribe to see new content all the time. And if you're interested, share with a wine loving friend, we'd love to grow the channel and see other people enjoy what we're doing here. You know, we are wine for the everyman, and I am really excited to be here with you guys kind of sharing my passion with you guys. Um, if you guys really like what you're doing, you can support us over on Patreon. It's, you know, all the people that are, that are supporters here are what makes this whole, this whole shenanigans possible. And I cannot say enough awesome stuff about my generous patrons plus you get exclusive content you're not going to see here on youtube so you're going to get what i'm drinking special recommendations you get access and you get to vote on the order of things that are coming up like we talked about before and you're going to get some other fun and cool stuff as the time goes on that is exclusive only to patreon so big shout out to our patron uh, our, our patreons at the seller level right our biggest supporters for uh barbara dan matthew dave and mary i appreciate you guys so very very much and uh I just love the fact that you guys are here joining us. So um, wild elk or farm elk. Wow. If they, if they farm elk, that's got to be a really rowdy farm, Mary. You guys, are, that's that's a thing, right? There's no way I admit poor, poor anything. It's just John, I know, is, it, it's his trademark. It's his, it's his love. So, and believe me, John, this is just one where we're going to just talk about rubies and tawnies and some basic pairings, right? We're not going to do a huge deep dive into port. We will do a port primer later where... Um, we're going to talk about port and all of its things. We're going to talk about rubies, tawnies, and LBVs. We're going to talk about vintage white and rosé ports eventually. So a lot more to the port topic than most people realize. It's not just uh, that sweet red wine drink that that, uh, that, that that Mama used to drink. It has got a lot more complexity to that. And uh, we've got some. We're going to you know it, we're going to learn. Where the value lines are, we're going to learn where, you know, when you when and how to pay for the big stuff. It's going to be great. And then we're going to talk about some fun stuff. So wild elk out of Washington State. Little red pepper. Awesome. Yeah. So, Jason, that's that case where for your uh, for that sausage thing, I would definitely, especially with the red pepper, with a little bit of flake in there, you're talking, you know, you want a wine that's got a little bit of oomph to, go, to kick back with it. So that'd be kind of fun. I would go with, uh, said so this is where Pinot Noirs would do no harm. Shrash Raz would be great. Um I mean, even on the lighter end of the scale, I think Gamay in its right form, if you go from something from south of uh, down in uh, the southern end of of uh, Burgundy, you know, you, you kick around at the uh, the Beaujolais region, you can find some pretty awesome, especially Cru Beaujolais. Man, you'd, you'd be setting yourself up for some awesome stuff there. So, guys, that's all I've got for you guys today. I want to say thank you yet again. Um, if you guys uh, see you guys next week here on Wine Shark Wednesday. And uh, for, until then... You know, cheers. And uh, from your wine shark, stay safe out there, guys. I'll see you all soon. Wait, okay, I have to wave before I say, actually have to end the stream.